Amen. Thank you, Pastor Justin. You may have to check this out again. It went off. Let me just do a little addendum to what I just told you about in the news. Sometimes when I tell you all this in the news, it seems so caustic, and it is. But remember, you are the answer to our world. Amen. Ours are not to take sides and try to, and try to push home something in an aggressive way. Jesus never said that. He said we should be harmless as doves. So if the world has any answer at all, it's because of us. Somebody say amen. So no matter how sharp your opinion or your conviction is, make sure it's always tempered with love. Amen. And make sure that you don't get on the side of the radicals. Don't fight the way they fight. Amen. Somebody say amen. How many are with me tonight? All right, open your Bibles to Psalm 19. We'll get that fixed in a moment. Uh, Psalm 19, and we're going to talk about uh, this. This, uh, this Psalm is about God speaks, and He speaks to us in many ways. A lot of people ask me how God speaks, or how does the heathen, how can the heathen who has never heard about God uh, find Him? Well, the, there's no excuse because the Bible tells you a way to find Him. We'll talk about that tonight. Uh, so I want to give you some of these things. They'll probably put the first one chart up, and we'll probably try to get the next one. It's from Psalm 19, verses 1 to 2. If you could put that one up. Uh, Pastor Justin for us while you're fixing that. Psalm 19, 1 to 2. I guess you can't put that up. So we'll get that sooner or later. Does anybody have your Bible out here? Let me have your Bible so I can read. There it is. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. How apropos, since we've been talking about blood red moons and we've been talking about, about lunar eclipses and solar eclipses, it's talking about the sky tells us something about God. How does God speak to us? Well, Psalm 19 gives us a powerful, one powerful way that he does. But before we explore that way, let me show you the other ways God communicates to us. That next chart, if you could put that up for me, would be great. Here it is. So you, he speaks to us through his word. We know that. Somebody asked me, how do I know what God's saying to me? Well, speaks to you through his word. Through the celestial heavens, there is something being shown in the celestial heavens. There is knowledge that is in the heavens. He also speaks to us through his prophets. He speaks to us through preachers. He speaks to us through dreams, through visions, through past history. He speaks to us through natural disasters, through wars and rumors of wars, through situations and circumstances, through times of distress, and in other ways, Isaiah tells us. So God can speak to us in a lot of ways. Our, our relationship with God is to not to ban or bar any, bar any of those ways and to make sure that they're confirmed. Thank you, Pastor. And to make sure they're confirmed because the Word is the primary way that God speaks to us. Somebody say amen. So as we see this, back to Psalm 19, notice verses 1 through 4. Notice what it says. It says that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament that's above us, everything we see, shows His handiwork. Day unto day utter speech and night unto night reveals knowledge knowledge, a very specific word. There's no speech or language where their voice is not heard. In other words, they go all over the world. It says, um, their line has gone out throughout all the earth and the words to the ends of the world. So it's a circuit. One, one translation says their circuit has gone out. So it actually talks about a circular type of thing for all of those people out there listening to me that are, are flat earthers. So it's a circuit that goes all the way out there. So it's talking to us every day. Now, Genesis tells us this, and we've, I've done a star study, and you may have heard, heard me uh, quote this. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, obviously sun and moon, and let them be for signs for seasons, for days, and for years. So we know that the lights in the heavens are for signs. That's part of it. So we want you to understand that. Job tells us some more things. In Job, it says this. He's talking about some of the constellations. Can you bind the sweet influence of Pallades? That's the same, that's the same word we use for the Pallades today. Job is the oldest book in the Bible. It's chronologically, it's been written, the, it's the first book written. That name, Pallades, as well as the rest of them, are thousands, five to six thousand years old. These names have been there long before any type of gods were assigned to all those stars and all those constellations. These were there. Uh, and it says, or loose the bands of Orion. Now, Orion's probably the easiest constellation to see. If you go in the night sky, you can usually see three powerful stars. That's the belt of Orion the hunter. Uh, can now bring forth Maseroth. Maseroth is the zodiac. It's mentioned in, in Job. It's the 12 signs of the constellations, 12 major signs that we know of. And by the way, I've told this to people all the time. You do not have a sign. Somebody says, what sign were you born under? You do not have a sign. These signs are not ours. They're, they're Christ. They're about Jesus. They're prophetic about His first coming, the first four. The middle ones are about the church age. And the last four is His coming back again. We know that Virgo the Virgin is the first one. Jesus came of a virgin. She's holding in her arm a uh, star. It's in her arm called Spica. 5,000 year old name. 6,000 years old. means the branch. Jesus is called in Isaiah the branch. The last constellation is Leo the lion. It has a star in it called Regulus. Regulus means 6,000 year old, old name 
and it means he will trample down. That's the line of the tribe of Judah that's coming back. Satan knows the message in the stars. It's about Christ. It's all about Jesus. So we don't have a sign. You may have been born under one, but that's not your sign. So the, the zodiac and, the, and astrology has stolen the major, the major story of the stars. Why do you think the Tower of Babel was there? Because the earth had had, had the great flood, the canopy of water that was over the earth had come in. It was magnifying the stars, bringing them close. But when the canopy broke, because it wasn't just 40 days and 40 nights that it rained, uh, Noah was in the ark a year and a, and a month. And so the great deep broke open, the canopy broke. And when that canopy broke, the stars looked like they were far, far away and they couldn't read them anymore. And so basically they had the Tower of Babel, an evil way to try to get to the story of the stars. So we know the Maseroth are the 12, are the 12 signs. Now again, I'm not going to teach you about the stars tonight, but I want to give you a little bit of understanding. That's the way they are in the ecliptic. If you take your arm and you go outside tonight and you raise it up 45 degrees, that's called the ecliptic. Every one of the constellations will pass through that ecliptic as we rotate. And so we see them all the time, certain times of the year. We know that if it's September, the sun's going to be in Libra. We know that if it's, if it's uh, another, that's where the sun is. It's going into that tabernacle or that covering of that constellation. And again, it's a lot for us to take in. I understand that. The earth being in the center, those stars. And by the way, the stars aren't there in a two-dimensional way. There's one here in the constellation. There's one out there very far, another one over here. So they're, they give us a backdrop, though. We see them all as like almost as a two-dimensional. So the Maseroth are the 12 signs. Now again, if I could show you some of these, we know that, uh, that the Butes is Arcturus, Alpha, Alpha Betos, which is in the night sky. There's the constellation. That, that hunter that you have there is a man-made hunter. That is not God's sign. That's from Greek mythology, which only goes back to about 600 to 800 BC. These stars have been there a long time before that. These constellations were known a long time before that. God took Abraham out and showed him the stars, if you remember, and told him that his sons will be as the stars of the, of the sky. We know that Orion is that constellation. There's the belt. Look at the hunter that's there. He has his one foot up and he's clubbing a lion. This is Genesis 3.15. This, this is a derivation of it. This is not Hercules. This is, this is Christ. The Bible says he will bruise your heel. That's why that's bruised. But you will, you will have a death blow to his head. That's Genesis 3.15, the verse prophecy. This is all about God. If you look a little bit further and you can see some of the other ones that are there, Taurus is the bull. The bull is, uh, is something that is, uh, Pallades is in there. That's a seven stars. You can look at Pallades so you can't look straight at it. But if you look at Taurus the bull and you look a little bit away, you'll see these seven stars. So seven sisters they're called. If you took, and this is going to blow you away. Again, I don't know if anybody else that teaches this, but I'm going to teach it to you because I have an astronomy background. If you took those seven stars and you took them down and you put them over Asia Minor, over Turkey, they will be the exact same positions of the seven cities of Revelation. The exact same positions. So this is the crown. This is something that has been there. God, God has such a, a marvelous way of bringing everything together. It's an ordered universe. If you see a little bit further and you go down here, you can see that this is the Pallades. There's the seven sisters I was telling you about. Those seven sisters, if you turn that and put it down, that's the exact postal route on the seven, the seven um, cities of, of uh, Revelation. So Psalm 19, 4 says, is then in them, in the stars, he has set a tabernacle for the sun. In what? In the line of the stars. Has set what for the sun? A tabernacle. It means an oh, it's in the Hebrew it's oh, oh hell. It means a covering. He set a covering for the sun. Now just follow this in a very simple way. So what can cover the sun? Well, the only thing that covers the sun is either the moon or us, a solar eclipse or a lunar eclipse. That covers the sun. It blocks it out. And so, and uh, what is that called? It's called a solar eclipse. So if we have a solar eclipse, then that, the moon comes in the position between us and the sun, which, by the way, the moon is the, in the exact, the exact size at the exact distance away from us that it can fully cover the sun. It's an unbelievable miracle that it could do that. If it was, it was a little closer, it wouldn't cover all the sun. If it was a little further away, you wouldn't see any of the corona. You wouldn't see any of the sun. It's a perfect match for the distance it's at from our viewpoint. So don't tell me God hasn't created this thing. So what does that, that show when that, when that happens? Well, Psalm 19.5 says, which is that a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. The uh, revelation of God in the, is the race of man, by the way. It's knowledge. So he says knowledge will be shown. When, some, when this moon, when he's telling us that, that not only is there knowledge of the stars, that's one part of it, but there's also a knowledge that will happen when, when, the, when the moon covers the sun in a solar eclipse and we see darkness. 
there's a knowledge that God wants to transmit. Now, l listen to that and, and understand you're going to hear something that's never been told to anybody before. So I want you to understand this because it's come, coming to you at a science way, an astronomical way, and also a prophetic way. So we see this happening. Now, I want you to understand in Psalm 19.4, it talks about a tabernacle or a covering for the sun. So our solar eclipses, what David is talking about, in Psalm 19, that's what he's talking about in Psalm 19. Are they still, did the Jews take them as a sign from God? Well, of course they did because the stars, the, the moon and the sun are for signs. And so we know that the Bible says this in Psalm 8, When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? So all over scripture you, you have these references of the sun and of the moon, whether being darkened or turning to blood, or even just the handiwork of God. The Jews know about this in Ecclesiastes 12, 1 and 2. Remember now thy creator in the days of your youth, while the evil days come not, for the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun, or the light, or the moon, or the stars, be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. Isaiah says it this way. He says, see, the day of the Lord is coming, talking about the last days, coming, it's in front of us yet. A cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. Boy, that doesn't fit with our progressive Christianity today. It says, the stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. And by the way, in a, in a solar eclipse, you cannot see any stars. The corona of the sun blocks them all out. Uh, the, the rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give her light. Now watch. I will punish the world for all its evil, the wicked for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and will humble the pride of the ruthless. Therefore I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will shake from its place at the wrath of the Lord Almighty in the day of his burning anger. So it's a prophecy. That has not happened yet, but it gives you some connotation of the stars and what their interplay of that day is. So whenever we see solar eclipses, yes, some of them can be familiar. Some of them can happen uh, no, regularly. Some of them can happen rarely. But they're all signs. Whether we know what they are, I have people writing to me all the time. What did the solar eclipse mean? I don't know what it means, but it means something. It's definitely a warning from God. It's why he speaks to us. It's why he talks to us. The Bur-Segal eclipse, which happened in 800 BC, was the eclipse that went straight over Nineveh that caused Nineveh to repent in sackcloth and ashes and, and respond to who? Jonah, when he came back, there was an eclipse that went right over that city. And so they feared God and they repented. And you can look back in Stellarium or any type of chart. You can chart the stars and the eclipses all the way back uh, since time immemorial. You have programs to do that. So we know that God uses those. Now, I want you to understand that even Joel says this, the sun and the moon shall be darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Again, think about a solar eclipse. When that moon moves over into, in the spot of the sun, before it does that, you can see all the stars. Once it does that, the corona of the sun shines around the moon and you can't see any stars. Joel is telling you something that's actually, uh, ast actually astronomical. He's telling you something scientifically. And why not? God's inspiring the word. Joel does doesn't know this, but God knows it. Come on, somebody say amen. Now, you should be amazed by now. You should be taking your, your jaw off your, off your lap and starting to put it back into your mouth. But there's more coming. Trust me. Uh, God is using these signs and these signs. In Mark, it tells us this. It says, but in those days, following the distress, last days, the sun will be darkened. This is Jesus talking. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky. In other words, you won't see them. Or you may have asteroids coming, stars falling from the sky. Asteroids. And the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, men will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. So we know that Christ's second coming is going to be just like his first coming. There's going to be some type of astronomical event that's going to happen. That's why I get excited when I think about astronomical events, because when he came in Bethlehem, what was there there? There was a syzygy. There was a conjunction of stars. Something else is going to happen when he comes the second time. How many are with me tonight? Amen. So we don't hear this preached a whole lot, but trust me, this is amazing to me because it's scientific way back in the Bible when these men weren't scientists they were just inspired by the Holy Spirit so what about, what about the exact year of 1919 well how does that parallel with Psalm 19 is there some celestial event that happens in there was there a type of solar eclipse that year well when I read it first I almost was afraid to do the research because if I came up with there was no solar, solar eclipses are pretty rare if there was no solar eclipse in 1919 that would destroy my my theory of the of this of the uh the the psalms paralleling the years and if it did come did it show knowledge because the bible says it shows knowledge when these things happen well guess what i started started search and it didn't take me long to find it and here's what i found
first thing I found was this got me kind of excited, but this isn't exactly what it is. A trip to the moon, March 29th, 1919. A trip to the moon by rocket may someday be possible. This is in 1919. According to a monograph published by Robert A. Goddard, a professor of physics at Clark University in Massachusetts, he has been experimenting with rockets since 1909 and demonstrated three models to the Army just before the armistice last year. Goddard's moon travel proposal is being ridiculed by newspapers which have dubbed him the moon man. So I saw that and I thought, well, I don't know, I can't make that stick. That's, that's not anything about showing knowledge. Uh, it may be some knowledge, but it has nothing to do with the, the sun. And maybe talking about the moon, but it has nothing to do with it. So I found something else. And this was kind of interesting when I found this one. This was uh, November. Scientists find gravity variations as a result of May 29th solar eclipse. There was a solar eclipse in 1919. Now, just hang on, because I'm going to tell you how it showed knowledge. It seems that in, in May of 1919, a total solar eclipse took place on planet Earth. It looked like this. And by the way, these are pictures from 1919. That's what it was. And this is a little article that came out. Solar eclipse of May 29th, 1919. That's an actual photo of the eclipse. So now that wasn't, that wasn't very common in 1919. You'd have to wait dozens of years before it to happen before or after. But something else was happening around that same time. I mean, Psalm 19 says it will show knowledge how? Well, an unknown scientist at the time, unknown, here's a picture of him in 1919. How many of you know this takes a lot of research? Albert Einstein, 1919. He was just formulating some of his thoughts in 1919. He came up with a new complex theory called the theory of relativity. And I know most people don't know. It was powerful. It was new knowledge. Uh, and everybody was laughing at him because he couldn't prove it. See, the Newtonian, said, the Newtonian spot said this, that gravity was only on the Earth. There was no such thing as universal gravity. And so everybody believed that. But Newton had said, no, no, no. It's all relative. And we have gravity. We have universal gravity. Now just hang on, because I'm not going to explain the whole theory of relativity to you, but I'm going to give you some of it. So look at Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2 again. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day pours forth speech. Night after night reveals knowledge. So it picked me uh, in my spirit to say, what knowledge could have been revealed here? And so I start digging some more. Now watch. Albert Einstein came up with this new theory. By the way, shows, that word showeth in their knowledge is kava. It means to prove knowledge or to declare knowledge. Besides the knowledge of the constellation story, which I just uh, briefly referred to, was there any more knowledge that happened because of the stars or the solar eclipse in 1919? So it kept put me on a search. You see, Einstein's theory of proven would show that gravity is universal, not just earthly. How do you prove that? That's a pretty tough thing to say and then have to prove it. How do you prove that there's gravity in space, especially in 1919 when nobody's even traveled into space? And if it is universal, then basically, um, how in the world would you prove it? Well, let me give you the next, well, I won't give it to you yet. Let me give you this. Let me show you a little bit first so I can get you a little bit up with me. How many of you remember, I'm going to bring you way back, Millennials, close your ears for a second because you're not going to see this. So, before I get there, so there's some type of thing that would be proving, given new knowledge, gravity is universal. I think that that was one of the things I was going on. Well, how do we know that? And how in 1919 did we know that? That, that you know, he postulated that, but he couldn't prove it. That the universe was expanding. That's what he was saying. If I could take, and I was going to do this for you tonight, but I don't want to get too deep into it. What the, what Newton said, and most of the scientists at that time said that the Earth is in a, in a the solar system in the universe is in a steady state. In other words, there's, there's uh, constellations and there's galaxies everywhere. So if you took a balloon and you blew it up and you put little black dots on it, you'd say, it's that way. That one's Alpha Centauri's over there and there's millions of constellations and, and galaxies. We're in this Milky Way galaxy. Andromeda is another galaxy. And there's millions of them. And they're saying they're all steady. They're not moving away from each other. There's no energy in there. They're just steady. We can look at them. So you take these balloons and you put little little dots on them and just blow the balloon up and show you that's where all the galaxies are. They're not getting closer to us. They're not going further away. Einstein says, no, no, no. There's such a thing as gravity in space and so they're expanding and they're going to they're fall back on each other. If there was something that happened and created these things, they said it was the big boom, but something created it, and they're pushing out and eventually they're going to come back on top of each other. We're in the pushing out stage, he says. We're in an expanding universe. If I took a balloon and put black dots on it when it was, before it was inflated and start blowing it up, then those dots would get further apart from every one and not closer to anyone, they'd be expanding. How many of you get that? 
Okay, so he says that's what, well, he couldn't prove it. There was no way he could prove that that was that. He couldn't prove that there was gravity and that we had expanding space. So he couldn't prove it. He just had a theory on it and he had figured it out mathematically. Instead of it just being there as, a, as steady, he says there had, to be a, there had to be something going on there that did it. How do you remember your black and white TVs? How many of you ever had a black and white TV? How do you remember at the, uh, we had a black and white TV when I was a kid. I was very small, so don't tell me I'm old. Very small. And at 11 o'clock, we had three stations, ABC, CBS, and NBC. And at 11 o'clock, all the stations went off the air. And what happened was you had this. And it went like this. Sometimes you'd have this, and it would go. Do you know what that sound was? That is the background radiation sound of the big boom. Of the, they called it the Big Bang. You see, that sound has been traveling out ever since the universe was created. And your TVs were picking it up. A scientist by the name of Leakey had discovered that, that he could point antennas anywhere, freeze them in, in liquid nitrogen in 1965, point them anywhere and hear that sound. That was a sound of some type of something, the, the, un, uh, the ungodly scientist says it was the big boom, it was the creation that came out. Or they say it was by, by two big uh, fiery balls, but, it's, but we know that's the big, they thought it was the big bang, that's the big boom, that's God's voice. And so this, shh, by the way, you can't find these anymore, they, the, all of them off out of, out of the uh, air, you can't, you can't get this type of, of system anymore that can, that can hear it. But you'd be hearing background radiation from the creation of the universe. That's what that was. Now just listen. So Einstein understands this. He knows what's going on. But could he prove that this was still going out? Could he prove that this thing was still happening? Could he prove his theory? How many are pretty excited and interested tonight? I'm not even at Psalm 19 yet. So he proposed it in 1915. He was laughed out of, out of I mean, he was, this, guy was a, this guy was just working in a, in a, as a lab technician. He wasn't even anybody. So there was no way to prove that outer space had a gravitational field or that our universe was expanding until 1919. Let me just tell you what happened in 1919. Einstein test Eclipse test proves Einstein's theory. Now think about night unto night showing knowledge and the stars and solar eclipses. A complete verification of Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity was reported this year at a historical joint meeting in London of the Royal Society and the Royal Astronomical Society. This is December of 1919, by the way. West Africa, it says, teams of British astronomers who went on an expedition to northern Brazil and Principal Island uh, off of the coast of West Africa to observe a solar eclipse last March 29th indicated that the path of light as it passed close to the sun was bent by exactly the amount predicted by Einstein. Einstein says, well, if, if, there's, if there's no gravity out there, then light would keep traveling in straight lines. But if there's gravity, it would bend. And so when the, so, when the, so, when the moon went across the sun, that, that corona you see is not straight lights. There are lights bending around the moon. It proves that there's universal gravity, and it proves that our solar system is expanding. Now, it only happened in 1919. 1919, day unto day utters knowledge, night unto night utters knowledge. Day unto day utters speech, night unto night utters knowledge. Listen to what it says. It says, John Thompson, president of the Royal Astro Astronomical Society, said that after hearing the report that Einstein's work is one, one of the greatest, perhaps the greatest of achievements in the history of human thought, it is pure knowledge. The phrase is especially meaningful because Einstein announced his theory in Berlin in 1915 during the war and became, because bitterness between the two former enemy nations is still strong. Verification of Einstein's theory means Sir Isaac Newton's picture of an absolute time and space must be replaced by that of a universe in which time and space are relative. Einstein's theory of relativity is so complex that only a few people are said to understand it completely. But what he was saying was that you can bend light, which means you can bend time, which means that it's almost like, I don't, I don't want to explain too much, but if you took a sheet, a bed sheet, and you took a bowling ball, and you put a, the bowling ball in the bed sheet, had four people tighten that sheet as hard as they can, and you put a bowling ball in that, on that bed sheet, the space from this side to this side would warp. And so you would be able to cross through time, not like you can today. It would be faster, because it would pull both sides in. How many of you get that? And he only proved that because of a solar eclipse. Now, again, I don't have enough time to tell you all of it, but I'm going to read you a couple of articles. Listen to this article that came out. Discovery 1, what, what we can learn from the century's greatest astronomical discoveries. This is from Fred Heron. 
In 1919, during a solar eclipse, Sir, Sir Arthur Eddington observed the bending of starlight passing the sun, matching the effect predicted by Einstein's general theory of relativity. If correct, this theory of gravity means the universe must be expanding. Einstein eventually announced, re, believed his, uh, his belief in the, he renounced his belief in an eternal universe and admitted that the universe, universe we have must have had a beginning. Astrophysicist George Smoot says, until the 1910s, humans were as ignorant as cosmic origins as they ever been. Those who didn't take Genesis literally had no reason to believe that there had been a beginning. Einstein said there had to be a creator because this is, this is something that's expanding. Something had, a, had, a, had an input. Somebody had an input here and it's going straight forward. This is another article. Einstein was very lucky because data that fit predictions of his new mathematical model were observed in light from, from, the, from the solar eclipse of 1919. Very soon after his model became public, the deflection of light around the sun was one such productive, predictive success of general relativity. The deflection angle tells us how far away the straight, the straight line of the path of the light pulse in question was deflected by the sun. The def deflection angle is by definition zero when there's no gravity. Now I have a whole bunch of formulas here that prove it. I'm sure none of us would understand. But it goes on to say this. Observations of starlight deflected around the sun were made during solar eclipses beginning in 1919. And the measurements supported Einstein's model, not Newton's, which predicted an angular deflection. And it says that it proved that there was a creator. Knowledge came out because of that. How many are following me tonight? If I would give you a little bit of an understanding, that line up there tells you how the light goes at. So, where are we at tonight? Let's talk. Job 9.9 says, Arcturus, Orion, Pleiades. Job 38.31, Pleiades, Orion. Job 38.32, Maseroth, Arcturus, all heavily signs. Amos 5.8, seven stars, Orion. Psalm 19.4, tabernacle for the sun, a covering for the sun. So, in short, let me tell you what he saw. Einstein saw the moon go across the sun he saw it cover the sun. He saw it darken the sun and cover it. Tabernacle it. You know what a tabernacle is? Jews know what it is. When they go to the waiting wall, they take their tallit and they put it over themselves and they make a tabernacle so that they're only in there. So, I, so the Bible says in Psalm that the sun was tabernacled. It was covered. And that's, that's before they even knew anything about a solar eclipse. There's nothing that can cover the sun except a solar eclipse. And so they knew that this was a covering for the sun. Now, let me just tell you something. Those, those rays, by the way, are bending around that sun. They're not going straight out. So did 1919 reveal when the sun was tabernacled and covered knowledge through heavens? I think I've proved that to you tonight. It has. So we can see what, what else has God to tell us. What, we can see what else God has to tell us through these things. What do solar eclipses, star movements, constellations prove to us? You may not ever understand all of them, but what do they prove? Well, that the heavens are one of the ways God speaks to us. Look, today, solar eclipses are increasing. These are the solar eclipses that have happened in 19, from 1941 to 1960. That's when the sun has been eclipsed by the moon. That's how many times it's happened. And by the way, they're increasing. Uh, this is from two, 1981 to 2000. Again, increasing. These are solar eclipses. The little squirrels you have, little squirrely curls you see, is because we're rotating. There's a lot of motion going on here when the sun's passing through. Now, I want you to understand all of this because it's no coincidence. Blood red moons are not the first things that out there that alerted us to the message in the stars. What does all it mean to us? Well, it's signs. Signs of what? Well, May 29th, 1919 presented the perfect moment in which to test Einstein's theory. Albert Einstein was a mathematician that changed knowledge forever on this planet. Let me add, he was a Jewish mathematician. The incredible, this is getting better and better. The incredible significance of Einstein's proven theory can be seen in the 19th Psalm. It happened in 1919 and God was giving the amazing details in Psalm 19, verse 4. Their line has gone out through all the earth. That's the lines he saw, the lines around the sun. And it also seems to describe the worldwide acceptance of Einstein's theory. In 1919, every scientist in the world said yes, he was right. In short, it said way back then that the universe has a creator. Also, the light rays from the stars that passed by the sun, photographed during 1919 eclipse, went out as lines throughout the earth. Just think about that for a moment. On that day in 1919, a Jewish mathematician fulfilled an ancient Jewish prophecy. If the theory is correct, and it is, it's now called the law of physics. Psalm 19 was fulfilled in 1919, and all the earth listened. How did all the earth listen? This is one more thing that's coming. I'll show you that in a moment. This is what's happening. It's going to happen in America. We've already seen one solar eclipse come in August 12th of, 2000, of 2015. Another one is coming in April 8th of 2024, exactly seven years later. It's going to crisscross America. And so, again, I'm going to get there in a little bit more, but let me just tell you a couple things. God wants to speak to man. 
He wants to tell us something. Look at verse, look at Psalm 19, 7 and 8. The law, and that's what he proved, the law, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commandments of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. And so there's a, there is a, there's a flow back and forth here of that knowledge. God is to reveal in Psalm 19 his will for his people. And in Psalm 19, in the meeting in Palestine uh, took place in Paris, about Palestine, President Woodrow Wilson put his hand on the shoulder of Rabbi S.S. Wise, the leader of the American Zionist movement, and said, have no fear, Palestine will be yours. God was moving in 1919. So what does Psalm 19 tell us today? Why did David write it way back in 1058 B.C.? Well, it reveals that God is continually wanting to communicate to his people. He wants to speak to us. He wants to speak to you. He wants to speak to me. He wants to communicate. It reads like Genesis does, if you really read it. Having begun with the vast reaches of the, of the cosmos, David ends with his own heart. Uh, you see, for David, he needed to know where he stood with God. All of us do. It still is God's intention through history, through the stars, through current events, through his prophets, through preachers, through his word, to reach us. God wants to talk to us. He's yelling at us. He's yelling at us from space. Not in a bad way. He's speaking to us through the word, through preachers, through dreams, through visions, through the stars. He wants to communicate with us. How many of you believe that? And he's doing it in a way that he has set up for thousands of years so that we can understand what he's saying. Are you going to understand all the signs of the stars? Of course not. Are you going to understand all your dreams? Of course not. But let me tell you something. When some of them are confirmed with the word... Like I just did tonight for you for 1919. Come on. Somebody say amen. Let me know you're out there. I hear you breathing. I need to know you're out there. All right. So, he wants to communicate to us. Let me show you the outline for tonight. As I go quickly. What time is it? Oh, my. All right. Here you go. I want to tell you about my works. Psalm 19, verses 1 through 6 are about the works of God. That God communicates to us through nature. That's how God communicates to us. Psalm 19, 1 to 6, real quick. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of says Nature. Day after day they put forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There's no speech or language where their voice is not heard. The voice goes out into all the earth, the words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, and yes, I'm going fast. God has pitched a tent for the sun. It's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens, makes its circuit. That means circular for all of you that believe in the flat earth. To the other, nothing is deprived of its warmth. So he's talking about nature. He's talking about a circular pattern. Everything God has created has a circular pattern. We, 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 everything he's created runs in cycles. It's an ordered universe. You have a solar system that has a circular pattern. You have us, our solar system, revolving around the Milky Way in a circular pattern. The Earth's orbit is a circular pattern. A woman's cycle is a circular pattern. The atoms and electrons are in orbits around each other. The quarks, the smallest particles we know, are all there traveling in order. Why? Because it's an orderly universe. The number seven is the number of divine completion and divine order. It's all over nature. God's works. We see it in nature all over the place. Let me show it to you quickly. We know that there are seven Greek words to describe the seven ages of man. We know it's infancy, pedion, child, which is a child, childhood, peos, boy, uh, youth, meikios, meikion, lad, adolescence, which is nian, nian, niskos, young man, manhood, enes, which is man, decline, prebutes, old man, senility, geron, which is age man. The various periods of gestation are also a commodity of multiples of seven, either days or weeks within uh, instant Insects, the majority of insects hatch in 14, 2 times 7 days, or 42, 6 times 7 days. With animals, a mouse hatches in 21, or is born in 21 days, 3 times 7. A hare and a rat, 28, 4 times 7. A cat, 28, 4 times, excuse me, 56, uh, four, uh, 8 times 7. A dog, 65, 63 days, 9 times 7. A lion, 93 days, 14 times 7. A sheep, 147 days, 21 times 7. With humans, 280 days, 40 times 7. You think that's coincidence? That's the hand of God. He's showing us something in his works. Birds are all hatching multiples of 7. A hen, 21 days. A duck, 28 days. Goose, 20, uh, 35 days. This is God's order. This is not something that's haphazard. Evolution can never do this. This is the order of God. This is the handiworks of God. Let me show it to you. Can God be seen in nature? You bet. We know the classification of animals and vegetable kingdoms are broken down into seven. That number of perfection. If you had a cocker spaniel, it would be the kingdom anim animal, the subkingdom vertebrata, the class mammalia, the order carnivora, the family canidae, the genus jog, and the species spaniel. Everything has seven, ca seven different char categorizations based on kingdom and subkingdom, class, order, family, genus, and species. Everything that 
that's there. It's an ordered work. Can God be seen in nature? You bet. We know that the rows of corn on a cob are always even. 8, 10, 12, 16, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, but never odd. 9, 11, 13, 15. The story is told of a slave who was offered his freedom if he found a cob with an odd number of rows. In 50 years, he never found one. In plants, there is an order of creation, a perfect order of creation. As the stems grow spirally, as they grow around, one leaf will come directly over another leaf this way. In an apple, every fifth leaf will come over the first one. In an oak, every fourth leaf over the first one. In a peach, every sixth leaf over the first one. And a holly, every eighth leaf over the first one. Don't tell me that there is not an ordered universe. Don't tell me that God doesn't have a plan. We can see Him in His works. You can see Him. If you, want, if you don't believe in God tonight and you're listening to me, just go out and look at nature. That does not come by haphazard evolution. That comes by some orderly design. There's a little bit more that goes on. In the case of, uh, in the, case of the bee, it's the number three that gives order. Uh, we know that in, a, in three days, the egg of a queen is hatched. It is fed for nine days, three times three. It reaches uh, maturity in 15 days, three times five. The worker bee, listen, the worker bee uh, reaches maturity in 21 days, three times seven, and is at work on, uh, leaving the cell. Uh, the, the drone matures in 24 days, three times eight. The bee has three sections, head and two abdomens. Well, uh, two, two eyes have 3,000 small eyes in them. Each, like cells of the comb, has eight sides, three times, excuse me, six sides, three times two. Uh, underneath the body are six wax scales within three times two with which the honeybee is made. Uh, and it has six legs. Each leg has three, three sections. The food has three triangular se sections. Uh, the, uh, the antenna have nine uh, sections. The sting has three, three times three barbs on each side. Is this coincidence or is it divine design? Why did the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Persians, and the Assyrians believe the bee to be the spiritual and worshipped it in sets of three? Why do, why do we even, even the Pope have three bees bees all over his all over his robe whenever he comes out to his in his regalia listen there is an order and there is design to our universe we know that we can see God through our works and so no one is without excuse all you have to do is look at the nature and understand nature and you'll find out that there's a God behind it come on someone say amen secondly he tells us this I'm going quickly I want to tell you about my words first he tells us about his works now he wants to tell us about his words we see it in Psalm 19 verses 7 to 11 the law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul the testimony of the Lord is short, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. He's telling us about his words. He's talking about his works first, now he's talking about his words. Is there an order to God's word? You better believe there's an order to God's word. In God's word there is the law, there is testimony, there is statutes, there's commandments there's fear of the Lord there's judgments the value of the word makes it perfect sure right pure clean true righteous uh, converting the soul making wise the simple rejoicing the heart enlightening the eyes enduring f forever if you want to follow the word of God then you're going to reach a perfection in the word of God you're going to get better and better and better your, your ultimate perfection comes when you're, when you're elevated to heaven but as you continue to study the word you will get more perfect more sure more right more pure more clean more true more righteous because the word is created to do that for you. It's created to make you into a perfect being, the Bible says. That's what the Bible tells us. And so we know that God can be seen in perfection in his works. He can be seen in perfection in his words. But I want to tell you about the last wonder, because the last wonder has to do with you and me. The last wonder is I want to tell you about my wonder. Psalm 19 verses 12 uh, to 14. Listen to what it says in the NIV. Who can discern his errors? Who, who sees God make an error? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins may they not rule over me then will I be blameless innocent of great transgression may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight O Lord my rock and my redeemer David's working through the creation of God he's working through the he's working through the, the wonders of God he's working through the words of God he's working through the, the, the works of God now for a moment forget about orbits for a moment forget about anything I told you in astronomy forget about the order for a moment and think of the one for whom God has created everything every single thing that you see or I see all of his wonders out there, all of his word out there. It's been created for you. It's been created for me. He has a design in mind and you're at the top of that design. You are the, you are the one that God is really starting to relate to. Listen, reflection in the heart tells us, it says the psalmist is longing to be pure in heart. He wants his motives and his hidden faults exposed so that he can deal with them. God's word is to be a measuring line, the standard to which he longs to conform. Why do you think when I talk about in the news that I'm constantly going back to God's word? It's not to judge anyone. It's to tell us that that's our line of perfection. Our line of perfection isn't us. You try to rule your life and it's like
like taking a plant and mixing it all up and thinking you're going to give it to someone. We're going to get our life messed up if we, if we draw on only ourselves. God has a plan for your life. He has a plan for my life. There's an orderly plan for your life. Yeah. Even if the enemy intends something for evil for you, God will use it for good because he has an order for your life. He knows your beginning from your ending. He knows where he wants to bring you. He knows why you were created. He knows why you were born. He knew you before you were in your mother's womb. All of this can tell you back to, the, to all of the, the news I've been telling you. God has a plan. He's got a plan for you as an individual. David started to realize, man, if you have taken your hand and you've sculptured all of those wonders out there, you've sculptured all of those works out there, all of nature comes unto you. You're minutia. If you've done that, if you've taken your word and you've planned it down through centuries and you have 66 different books with hundreds of different authors, if you've done all that, I'm the creation that you're really concerned with, so you must be taking care of every single part of me. So God, if I have a wicked thought or if I have a wayward thought, take care of it, God. Put me under your order. Put me under your creative ability. Put me under your hand. Are you getting it tonight? Because God cares about you more than he cares about his creation. He cares about you more than he cares about the flowers and the bees and everything else. You're the crown of his creation. Man, just listen for a moment. Com contemplate, therefore, either the skies or the scriptures or the soul, and you're face to face with God. In the skies is revealed his glory. In the scriptures is greatness. And in your soul, his grace. Because his grace, listen to what his grace does. All those animals you created, all the insects you created, all those things follow a natural pattern. They're called instinct. They're going to be the same way all the way down the line. You may vary them a little bit. But you, you're a wild one. God just couldn't create a human and say, well, that's going to, be, that's going to do everything I want him to do. No, you have a wild nature. You are a wild vine. So am I. But God takes all that wildness when we put it into him and he makes order out of it. Think of where you'd be without God in your life. Think of where you'd be without salvation. He's ordered your life just like taking one leaf and putting it over another in a spiral. He's ordered your life. The enemy knows it too. That's why he's after you all the time. That's why he's trying to deviate everything from you because God has ordered you. Man, I'm going to get really excited tonight. Amen. I'm going to start yelling and screaming and running. I don't need anybody to help me. So listen. At the end of Psalm 19, David is confessing to God. He is praying through his frail life. I'm getting quickly to the end. He's praying beyond himself, past his insecurities and past his faults. Our problem is we look too much at our faults. God knows you have faults. Amen. He knows you have insecurities. He knows you're going to sin. He has, uh, he has an answer for all of that. He has a way to bring it all back around to make sense. Amen. Into the realm of what he is in God. He's finding out who he is in God. You see, you know, we go outside and we look at a beautiful sunset. That can't compare to your life. Beautiful sunset's nice to see. But you know, when God looks at a sunset and he looks at you, he doesn't say, ah, oh, look what I did with the sunset. He says, ah, oh, look what I did with Mark Carell. You're the beauty of God's eye, not a sunset. Understand who you are in him. You see, he accepts the fact that he's flawed, just like all of us, and that God's wonder is far beyond his works. David's a wonder of God. You're a wonder of God. Turn to your neighbor and say, man, you're a wonder, you're a wonder. of God. Let me make sure you finish it. We're living in the last days. As I close tonight, let me just tell you what the Bible says. O oh Lord our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You've set your glory above the heavens. We know that Psalm, Psalm, this Psalm 19 tells us that God is speaking to us. All those Psalms talk about God speaking to us. In Isaiah it says this, Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, us, Israel and us, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. He's saying, you can be as wise as you want to be. Be a scientist, but it has nothing, compares nothing that I know or nothing that I can do. I started this message telling you about the heavens. David looked up before he ever looked inside, and you have to. You've got to look up before you ever look inside. I remember talking to, uh, quickly to talking to in BAR, Biblical Archaeology Review, talking to a professor from Oxford who was in Israel doing a dig, and he, was, he knew the Bible inside out, and he knew it in Greek, knew it in Hebrew could quote it all the way down the line and I knew he knew I was totally against whatever he thought because he was an unbeliever. So he said something one time and I can, I, I've shared this before and I a room full of about 250 people uh, educated people I raised my hand and he uh, looked at me and said yes Pastor Carell. He knew I was going to go against them. He says I guess you're going to doubt the carbon dating. I said no 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 and I told, I told him and kind of stumped him in a sense and he looked at me and he said uh something to the effect of how do you go I said well let me tell you something you said that if you find it in the dirt then you'll believe it I said you can't find God looking down you've got to find him looking up right, 
Amen. You look at your situations, you'll never find God. You've got to look up. Look, the truth is evident. Albert Einstein proved the existence of God through darkness. Look, the truth is evident. If you are, you are wait out the darkest moments of our lives, God will always prove himself to us. It's in darkness that you see the light. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Take Joel's account of 231. Remember I, started, I told you I was going to tell you about it? This is what he said. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon shall into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day. That's a solar eclipse he's talking about. He has no idea what one is. He's talking about a solar eclipse. Now, let me share something with very few people, if anybody knows. Joel wrote this in 800 B.C. There was no such thing as a blood red moon in 800 B.C. You know why? Yeah, there were lunar eclipses. But do you know why a blood red moon comes? Because of all of the volcanic ash, because of all of the industrial pollution since the 1800s, we have pushed all of the dust because of 8 million people wandering on this planet. All of our cars, all it's put dust into the atmosphere. When that dust goes into the atmosphere and the sun and the, and the earth moves in fr front of the sun, it shoots the sun's rays across our atmosphere and our sun's rays bend and the longest wavelength, which is red, hits the moon. It's impossible to do before the 1800s. Before the 1800s, every lunar eclipse that we just saw was gray. And Joel probably saw a lunar eclipse. They were gray. There was no such thing as a blood red moon. And so I'm sure nobody talks about that. Look, science has a long way to go. To, to ed, uh, the educated of our planet who don't know God are like blind men in a dark room searching for a black cat. Science would do well to check with God's word before posturing a theory. Isaiah 61 and 2, as I told you, will tell you this. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the people. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. You know what he's telling you? He's telling you that you are the sun. He's telling you you're the light of the earth. Even though darkness will cover you, your light will shine. No matter what happens in your life. How many of you have ever been, gone through a dark time? That's the time when the light really shines. Listen, I want to just tell you one last thing. We've seen a total solar eclipse in America in August 21st, 2017. I was in a plane and I flew watching the eclipse probably longer than anybody else with a team of scientists telling them about God's plan. This is coming again. Seven years, seven months, and a couple days. And by the way, if you look at that real close, it forms a cross. God is speaking to America. Amen. He is telling us something. What could it mean? I don't fully know. But it has meaning, I assure you. And it all has to do with God's works, His words, and His wonder. And it all has to do with the crown of His creation, which is us. Ephesians 2, 4, and 7, and I'm closing right now. But God, bring, being rich in mercy because of the great love which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved, and raised us up with Him, and seated us with him. Now, this is, he's, it's, it, that is spoken as a fact, not something to come, but some, as a fact. It's already established. And as by grace and have been saved, uh, raised us up with him and seated, past tense, us with him in heavenly places. He's saying it as it already has been in Christ Jesus, even though it hasn't happened yet. So that in the coming ages, that means this place is not going, this place is going to go way, way beyond what we think. In the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. You are the crown of his creation. In closing, remember this about God's will and God's grace in your life. The will of God will never take you where the grace of God will not protect you. I'm amazed at God's works. I've studied astronomy before I was ever saved. I was amazed at astronomy. When I, when I see it applied to Christianity, it blows me away because I see God everywhere. Listen, he won't show you a sign, but they're all over the place. If you're looking for one, he's not going to show you, but they're everywhere. Amen. All you have to do is look up and look at him and look inside and find your maker. Tonight, I'm going to ask you just to bow your heads with me for a moment. If you're listening to me at home, and I know a lot of you are because this goes out all over the place. Some of you are listening, and I, we know we have Muslims that listen. We know that we have people who are unsaved that listen. I, I, get, I get mail from people who are gay. I get mail from everybody you could possibly imagine. And I'm so thankful you're listening. But understand that we have to take our lives and bow them before God. If you do that, he will make you so much better than you could ever think you were. And so tonight I really petition you to listen to what I said. I gave you incontrovertible proof of God through nature, through his word, and through the wonder he's done in us. So tonight, with all of our heads bowed, let me take nothing for granted if you're here tonight. And man, you've just been having a tough time and you just need to get back on fire for God. Would you raise your hand? 
and there and there and there and there and there. Let's just pray tonight. Father, I thank you tonight. I thank you for everyone that is here and everyone within my range of my voice. I thank you that we are the crown of your creation. Some of us, Lord God, have settled for our own lives and our own lives are at the bottom of, of, of where we are, Lord God. Raise us up, Lord God. Raise us to that spot where we shine as your jewels, Lord God. Let your spirit and your word come deep inside of us. Bless us now, Lord God. Bless the families that are here, those that are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you.